Bonjour! Did you know that Paris boasts two of the four most visited palaces in the world? Indeed, the Louvre, not only a palace but also the world's most visited museum, shares the spotlight with the Palace of Versailles. These two iconic landmarks are only rivaled by the Forbidden City in Beijing and the Royal Palace in Bangkok in terms of global popularity. Let me embark you on a virtual tour of the Palace of Versailles. But first, I'll guide you on how to reach Versailles, as it's about 20 kilometers west of Paris. From Paris to Versailles, there are many transport options. You can take a taxi or Uber, get on board a bus or choose to take the train. Depending on where you take it and on the traffic, a taxi would cost in between 35 and 55 euro, and a Uber free now or bold would cost roughly the same price. The bus comes as the cheapest solution. The cost is only 1T plus ticket or 2 euro 10. Take the 171 bus at Metro Pont de Sèvres, last station on line 9 of the metro, and exit at Château de Versailles after 30 minutes without traffic. There are three train options to choose from, depending on where you are staying in Paris. This train, regional train line L, goes from Gare Saint-Lazare in Paris to versailles rive droite station. It takes 45 minutes and costs €4.95. Euro. Just make sure to take the train that goes to versailles rive droite as there are three branches on line L. When in Versailles, you'll have to walk 20 minutes, 1.4 km, to the palace. The second train option is regional train line N from Gare Montparnasse to Versailles Chantier Station. It takes 25 minutes and costs €4.05, Euro but you still have a long 1.5 km, 25 minutes walk to the palace. The best solution by train is the RERC, which links seven stations in Paris to Versailles Château Rive Gauche, the nearest station to the Palace of Versailles. It takes 25 to 43 minutes depending on where you board it and costs €4.05. Euro. From Versailles Château Rive Gauche, the walk is then only 900 meters or 11 minutes. Convenient, fast, cheap and close to the Palace entrance, RERC to me is the best solution to go from Paris to the Palace of Versailles. And do not forget that if you have a Navigo Découvert travel card with a weekly or monthly pass, then you won't have to pay anything, as Versailles being in zone 4, the journey would be included in your pass. The same goes for the Paris Visit Cardboard ticket when to 4. There are three main things to discover at the Palace of Versailles. The palace in itself, the gardens and park, and the estate of Triano. The gardens and park are open every day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., 8.30 p.m. in high season. The palace and the estate of Triano are open every day except Mondays, from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. in high season for the palace, and from 12 noon to 5.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m. in high season for the estate of Triano. The access to the gardens is free, except on days of Fontaine's shows and musical gardens. Access to the Palace and Triano is free for visitors under 18 or under 26 if they live in the EU. Otherwise, the Palace access fee is 19,50 euro and the Triano is 12 euro. There's also a passport that includes both entrance to the Palace and Triano for 21,50 euro. To access the Palace, booking a time slot online is mandatory even if you have a free ticket. For this, you have to go to billetterie.chateauversailles.fr. When you book online, your ticket lets you enter the palace within the half hour following your reservation time. There are also many different guided tours, depending on the day you want to go to the palace. Only one of these tours is in English though, the guided tour of the king's private apartment. It costs an extra 10 euro and lasts an hour and 30 minutes. If you consider doing this guided tour, you'd better book it at the same time you're booking your entry ticket. Audio guides are available for free in 11 languages French, English, German, Spanish, Italian, Russian, Mandarin Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Korean and Polish. You can also enjoy audio guide tracks on your smartphone and not queue at the audio guide desk by downloading for free the Palace's applications, available in English, Spanish and French. Now, if you want to know more about the Palace of Versailles, join me for the rest of this video as I guide you through a comprehensive tour of the palace.
Unlike our usual content, today's video will feature the Palace of Versailles without any background music, just raw footage, providing an authentic and unfiltered experience of this historic masterpiece. Join me for a unique exploration. Even with your timestamp ticket, you'll have to stay in line for some time because of the security check. This former royal residence welcomes almost 8 million visitors each year to admire its lavish rooms, art collection and splendid gardens. One of the greatest achievements in France's 17th century art, the palace contains a staggering 2,300 rooms. But don't be afraid, we're not going to visit them all. By the way, if you notice people wearing masks in the video, please keep in mind I filmed it last year. Today in Paris, mask wearing is no longer a common practice. Let's get inside. Louis XIII's old hunting pavilion was transformed and extended by his son, Louis XIV, when he installed the court and government there in 1682. A succession of kings continued to embellish the palace up until the French Revolution. In 1789, the French Revolution forced Louis XVI to leave Versailles for Paris, where he was beheaded four years later. The palace would never again be a royal residence and a new role was assigned to it in the 19th century, when it became the Museum of the History of France. Construction of the Royal Chapel was completed in 1710, at the end of the reign of Louis XIV. It's a pity we can't visit it. We are now entering the Palace History Gallery. In this section of the palace, three digital videos narrate the history of both the palace and its enchanting gardens. I present them to you here with the kind authorization of the public establishment of the palace, museum and national estates of Versailles. Combined, these videos have a duration of 8 minutes and 13 seconds. If you prefer to skip them, feel free to jump ahead to the next chapter at 1640. Versailles wasn't built in a day. It all began in 1629, when King Louis XIII had a hunting lodge built, replaced sometime later by a stone and brick chateau. King Louis XIV inherited this small chateau. In 1666, the sovereign embarked on major building work. Over 50 years, he continued to extend and transform what became Europe's largest chateau, the Palace of Versailles. Architect Louis de Vaux designed two symmetrical grand apartments for the king and the queen. Louis XIV moved his government and court to Versailles. After a new program of works, Jules Ardouin Mansart replaced the terrace overlooking the grounds by the Hall of Mirrors, which became the court's main ceremonial reception room. Mansart further extended the palace to accommodate the royal family, the court and all the government departments. With the servants, the kitchen and stable staff, close to 10,000 people were bustling about the palace. At the end of his reign, Louis XIV moved his bedchamber to the center of the palace. This room was the hub of the king's daily ceremonial routine and that of all the Versailles courtiers. 
Towering over the other buildings, a royal chapel was finally built by Mansart on the same scale as the palace. When King Louis XV moved to Versailles, he broke with strict court etiquette and fitted out smaller apartments for more comfort and privacy. At the end of his reign, Louis XV built what the palace was missing, a real opera house. Architect Gabriel modernized the facades closest to the town. In 1789, the French Revolution forced the royal family to leave Versailles for Paris. The future of the palace looked uncertain. With the revolution, the royal railings, a symbol of absolutism, were destroyed. The king left Versailles for good. The collections of paintings were taken to the Louvre, and the furniture was auctioned off and dispersed. But in the end, the palace was preserved. During the First Empire, Napoleon renovated the Grand Trianon for residents during the summer months. Sometime later, Louis XVIII restored the symmetry of the palace by erecting the Pavillon du Four. Louis Philippe transformed the former royal residence into an historical museum. The former prince's apartments were replaced by a large gallery of paintings, the Galerie des Batailles. The fledgling French Republic took possession of Versailles and renovated the Salle du Congrès to accommodate the National Assembly and the Senate. Versailles today is the result of this long history. A former royal palace with prestigious collections, an historical museum, a republican palace. It's also a living place which hosts festivals and shows, dazzling as it did under Louis XIV, visitors from all over the world. The gardens of Versailles, created by André Le Nôtre, are a key component of the royal residence. They surround the chateau on three sides. In the 1660s, the east-west axis became the Grande Perspective. The gardens surrounding the palace were made up of parterres, enhanced by fountains. They are extended by paths opening onto copses with surprising lawns and water features.
King Louis XIV had the Grand Trianon built in the grounds as a summer family residence and a refuge from the hubbub of the court. King Louis XV fitted out the Petit Trianon for Madame de Pompadour, and Louis XVI gave it to his young wife, Marie Antoinette. The Queen gave orders for the gardens to be replanted in the English style and built a rustic hamlet, a working farm, complete with cottages. On the ground floor, these adjoining rooms provide a chance to explore and learn more about the history of the palace. This is a model of the king's bedroom that you'll see later. Now let's go up to the main floor of the palace. In this series of rooms, known as the Louis XIV's rooms, you'll find a vast array of historical portraits and landscapes, though they may not captivate everyone's interests.
Finally, while I appreciate the historical paintings, the sheer quantity stacked together felt a bit overwhelming, almost like an overdose. We are here in the upper chapel vestibule. From there, you have a great view of the rural chapel. We are now entering Hercules' room, which leads to the state apartments. Paintings on each of the opposite walls are by Veronese. They were a gift of the Republic of Venice. The Salon of Abundance is the first of the state apartments rooms. The king's state apartments were originally intended as his residence, but Louis XIV transformed them into galleries for his finest paintings and venues for his many receptions. This salon, the Salon of Venus, was used for serving light meals during evening receptions. We are now in the Salon of Diana, which was used by Louis XIV as a billiard room and had galleries from which courtiers could watch him play. The Salon of Mars, once used by the Royal Guards, was turned into a concert room, 
with galleries for musicians on either side. The Salon of Mercury was the original state bedchamber when Louis XIV officially moved the court and government to the palace in 1682. The bed is a replica of the original, commissioned by King Louis Philippe in the 19th century when he turned the palace into a museum. The automaton clock was made for the king by the royal clockmaker Antoine Morand in 1706. When it chimes the hour, figures of Louis XIV and fame descend from a cloud. The Apollo room was once the main room, and therefore the most sumptuous of the king's apartments, since it served as the throne room from 1682. At the end of the king's apartments, at the corner of the palace, the roar room overlooks the Hall of Mirrors. The 73 meter long gallery linking the king's and queen's apartments replaced the terrace. There are 357 mirrors in the Hall of Mirrors. <coughs> the ceiling fresco painted by Lebrun embellishes the first 18 years of Louis XIV's reign in 30 scenes. At the third of the gallery, a mirror door leads to the king's chamber. First, the council room, where the king would meet with his councillors.
In 1701, Louis XIV moved his bedchamber into this large room situated in the center of the eastern facade of the palace. Louis XIV died in this bed on September 1, 1715, after a reign of 72 years, the longest in the history of France. The bullseye antechamber is named after the circular window which brings light into the room on the southern side. This antechamber leads back to the Hall of Mirrors. At the end of the Hall of Mirrors, opposite the Chamber of War, is the Chamber of Peace. The Chamber of Peace leads straight to the Queen's bedchamber. The bedchamber is the most important room in the Queen's apartment and is where the Queen spent most of her time. It was where she slept, often with the King, and in the morning she receives guests here. It was also here that the Queen gave birth in public.
to the princes and princesses of the realm. Nineteen princes and princesses of the realm were born here between 1682 and 1786. The royal table antechamber is where public meals were taken by the royal family. Only the members of the royal family were allowed to dine here, while privileged duchesses, princesses or those holding important positions sat in front of them on stools. In the Queen's Guard room, 12 of the Queen's Guards were on duty day and night. We are now leaving the Queen's State Apartment. This room is called the Coronation Room. In 1833, it became a room devoted to the glory of Napoleon Bonaparte, first consul and then emperor of the French. In the center of the room stands the Austerlitz column, which Napoleon commissioned from the Sèvres Royal Porcelain Manufactory to commemorate his first imperial victories. coronation by French painter David, which was located in this room and actually shows the coronation of Empress Josephine, was moved from Versailles to the Louvre in Paris in 1889. This is a second version that David also painted.
The Gallery of Great Battles is the largest room in the palace, 120 meters long and 13 meters wide. It covers almost the entire first floor of the South Wing. King Louis Philippe displayed 33 paintings here, depicting the greatest battles that had influenced the history of France, from the victory in Tolbiac by Clovis to the victory in Wagram by Napoleon in 1809. All the dynasties from the history of France are evoked, including the Merovingians, Carolingians, Capetians, Valois and Bourbon. Since its opening, the gallery has remained intact and untouched, with all the works commissioned by the citizen king Louis-Philippe for its decoration. Some of these battles are also battles of the Allies of France, as shown in this painting of George Washington and Admiral de Grasse at the Siege of Yorktown.
this long corridor brings us back to the exit of the palace. The exploration of the gardens is equally captivating. However, on that chilly day, I limited my visit to the immediate surroundings of the palace. This time, enjoy the ambience with music and let the visuals speak for themselves. No commentary.
This is the end of our walking tour of the Palace of Versailles. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed visiting this magnificent palace. See you soon on another Paris Top Tips video.